On this Resurrection Sunday, would you join me in honoring our senior pastor, Pastor Lynn Hardy, this morning? Good morning, Valley Church. Man. Turn to a neighbor, give a high five. This is Celebration, Resurrection Sunday. Ah, I have my heart full already. Wow. We just had a wonderful time up there. It's like, oh, praise God. Father, I just thank you for this, for this beautiful day. I pray that you would just be with us in such a special way this morning as we come to celebrate Resurrection Sunday, the resurrection of your only begotten Son, resurrected to life, to all authority. We just give you thanks. We just give you praise in Jesus' mighty name. And we say, have your way this morning. Have your way. Amen. Amen. Had a thought. It's like, oh, that's scary. <laughs> uh, a, a scripture that came to mind just before I, I came up here, and so I jotted this down really quick, that I want to read to you. Um, from Second Timothy. Be reading verses three through five. I thank God, whom I serve with a pure conscience, and as my forefathers did, as without ceasing. Yes, let me correct this. I want to go to chapter four, Second Timothy three through five. This makes more sense. I might even start with verse 1. If we're going to get you confused, I might as well go all out. <laughs> Chapter 4, verse 1. We're going to start there. This is a charge from Paul to, to Timothy. I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ. So I bring this as a charge before all of you. Who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom? Preach the word, be ready in season, out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. And here's where I was going to start. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. And they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you, Turn to your neighbor and say, you, be watchful in all things, endure affliction, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. It's like, are you open for an itchy ears message this morning? Or are you ready for some truth? truth. Well, we're 25% ready for truth, I guess, so... Maybe that's enough, or, or I could do it again. Are you ready for a, some truth this morning? Yes. Oh, that makes me feel better. I'm not quite so nervous now, you know. It's really, uh, I think, of teachable moments, and I, I feel like Easter is a very Easter, Resurrection Sunday, is an opportunity to, to really teach something this, this morning. Uh, and so that's exactly what I want to do. Uh, my message this morning... I have about three different titles, but it's part of it, it's going to be about two gardens. The first garden being the Garden of Eden. We're all familiar with the Garden of Eden, with creation, and, and, uh, and what happened in the Garden of Eden, this amazing, incredible place that God created and established for man, for Adam and Eve, right? Everybody's familiar with that, but I want to read just a little bit of it, and we're going to bounce a little, I'm going to end up sharing, elaborating some on the scriptures that I'm reading, because I really feel this morning that it is important that we visit the two gardens 
in the Bible. And uh, the first being creation, Garden of Eden. Genesis 1, verses 26 and 28. I had a, a lot that I want to cover, so we're just going to jump in and get going. Verses 26, 28 of chapter 1. God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them, them, them being man, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. I think this is really important right here. God created man how? In his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. He created them. Verse 28, then God blessed them and he said to him, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth, subdue it. He says, subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So God gave them dominion, power, authority over everything that he had created. Right? We were given, back then, through Adam, all authority, total dominion over everything that he had created. I want to go to uh, <clears throat> Genesis chapter 2, 24 and 25. After he's created man and woman, he said, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And they were naked, the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. Oh, they were a married couple. Can you imagine in the perfect garden where they could walk around naked, they didn't have to have sandals, they weren't worried about stickers getting scratched, getting slivers in the bottom of their feet. They had perfection. Right? And they were completely unashamed as they walked around naked. Man, what a dream garden that would be. <laughs> Every garden I've been a part of was weedy, stickery, nasty. I wouldn't think of going out in any of our gardens naked, I can tell <laughs> And the neighbors. Okay, um, chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. It's like, did they have dominion over the serpent? Yes, absolutely. But he was cunning, and he had a voice. It's one of the thoughts that I had for this message is there's more than one voice. You know, so they had not only heard the voice of God giving them instructions about that tree in the middle of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. So they heard the voice of God. They were accustomed to the voice of God. But there was another voice that entered. And I believe that they must have heard that voice before. I don't think this was the very first time. But the enemy engaged them. And right off the bat, he said, the God said, <clears throat> I'm going to start over. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, It's like my say, Why would you even engage the serpent? But she did. And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat from the fruit of the trees of the garden. But the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God said, you shall not eat, nor you sh shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, you won't surely die. That's ridiculous. That's a tree with fruit. For God knows that in that day when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So we know what happens after that, huh? She had made sense to her. She partook. Her husband was close by. She gave it to her husband. They ate. And their eyes were open. As we read on, 
They heard later, beginning with verse 8, they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. It's like, oh, something that they so looked forward to every day in the cool of the evening when the presence of God came in. They looked forward to that, but now they hid themselves from his presence among the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called to him and said, where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. So God was more than just a little upset with them. They ended up kicked out of the garden, moved out of the garden. No longer was there perfection. But since they partnered with the voice of the enemy, not just because they went and partook of the tree, but out of rebellion, they partnered with the voice of the enemy, allowing him a foothold in their lives, giving up the authority that they had been given because they handed it over to the devil. Right? That's pretty sinister, serious stuff. This is not a, a feel-good message. Adam's failure, some called it Adam's rebellion, but I believe that them listening to the voice, they partnered with the wrong voice because it began to make sense to them. It's like, huh, huh. It doesn't look that bad. You know, we, we, we live in a... a a society that has a tendency. We're going to end up talking more and more about the flesh. I've got some more scriptures to, uh, to go, but I wrote down the tendencies of our nature is to gravitate toward the voice that satisfies the desires of our flesh in our own understanding. Does this make sense? The fall of Adam opened the door to the sin nature which we were born into because of that failure. And we then are predisposed to have a tendency to lean through our nature, to gravitate towards the voice that satisfies the desires of our flesh in our understanding. Like the world says, seeing is believing. We look. It looks good, it smells good, it feels good. If it tastes good, our flesh says do it. Is that not right? That's our natural, we're predisposed to lean towards sin because we were born into that nature. Everybody, this makes sense? Anybody disagree? Wow, it's unanimous. Okay, through, through our, our tendencies, because we were born into that. So, God says the voice of God is totally different. It is supernatural. It so oftentimes comes against our flesh, our common sense, what we have a tendency to believe and lean into, because so oftentimes what we can say absolutely doesn't make sense. Like, how could that ever work? Like, how could actually <clears throat> there be a healing without medication or without surgery or something? Somebody miraculously healed. Does that even make sense? To our mind, we would reject that supernatural word where it says, if two of you are gathered in my name and you believe, ask it in my name and it'll happen. Does that make sense? Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah. Well, to this congregation, I believe that makes sense. But to the world at large, does that make sense? No. In Western medicine, we've been, we've been taught, we've been raised up we, to believe what we hear in the flesh. It has to make sense. We have to understand it with our understanding. Forgetting that his ways are above our ways. His thoughts are above our thoughts. Our understanding is so finite and limited that we, we reduce ourselves to our experience. And oftentimes we will reduce and we will rewrite the scriptures to our experience, our beliefs based on our experience, 
Are you still with me? Man, it's just getting quieter and quieter. John 10.10, 10, I, I heard Pastor Matthew quote this. This is in, in, my, in my notes here. It's like John 10.10 10 says, The enemy comes but to kill, steal, and destroy. Maybe not in that exact order, but Jesus came that we would have life and life to the abundance. It's like, oh, so we have an amazing hope in him, that hope being in Jesus Christ and the free gift that he has given to us. As we move through Genesis and how God dealt with sin, the sin nature, and, and, and what men gravitated to, it's like, oh, ouch. Uh, I, I want to read yeah, the serpent. Let's go to uh, chapter 6, verses Uh, chapter 6, verse 3, and then we'll go to 5 and 6. See, God, in his frustration, said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh. Everybody say flesh. When the Bible is talking about flesh, it's talking about our flesh, all our senses, what makes up who we are in the flesh, not what we are in the spirit. It's we are spirit and we are flesh. So flesh is in the Bible is referring to anything that's not spirit is flesh. Okay? All right, so man indeed is flesh. I'm not going to end up dealing with him forever, so I'm going to limit his days to 120 years. Not going to live to 900, not going to live to 700, 800. I'm fed up with this. We're going to limit it to 120 years from now on. It's like, boom. That's how we're going to end up dealing with this. That was like plan number one. Plan number two, we see what happens to Noah. So let's read verses five and six. I think that's where I have next. Six, five, and six. Then the Lord saw that wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. It's like, oh, so the predisposition of man in the fallen state was gravitating to evil. It's like, you know, when I think of man serving himself, I think of the term selfish, you know, it's like when you look at this, this, this stripe around it is reddish, isn't it? It's not just bright red, but it's reddish. It's like when we are servants of ourselves, when we're serving our flesh, our needs we become self-ish, like reddish, like blackish, like bluish, like very much ishish about ourselves. Does that make sense? I thought that was kind of cool myself when I thought that up this morning. It's like, you know that? <laughs> ish, ish, self-ish. Uh, okay, we're moving on now. And the Lord was sorry that he made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. Hmm. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I've created from the face of the earth, both, <clears throat> both man and beast, creeping thing, birds of the air, for I'm sorry that I made him. But Noah found grace in the sight of the Lord. Noah walked with God. Noah's in, in the genealogy of Noah, perfect in his generation. Noah walked with God. So God found one perfect man, and he thought, here's the solution now. I'm going to get rid of all the rest of them. 
It's going to be Noah and his genealogy from here out because here is a perfect man. But what happened? Oh, the flood destroyed all of mankind except for that Noah, his sons, daughters-in-law, and two of every kind and six or seven of certain kinds that, you know, they went into the ark. The earth was flooded. It was destroyed. And what happened next? Well, we can move into Sodom and Gomorrah. And what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah? It's like, oh, he tried, God tried to blot out, to destroy sin and evil works. And did that work? No. No. Coming to the, re- us coming to the realization, me to my understanding. I'm not talking about God's understanding. I'm talking about as Lynn reads through this and what Lynn comes up with. It's like, okay. He tried to blot out evil. That didn't work because the predisposition of man in his fallen state automatically leans into and begins to fall into evil. Right? Are we still on the same page? And it's okay. So he blots out evil again. Only Lot and his daughters are saved. The rest of it, they were so depraved, sexual depravity, depraved, however, depraved, sick, sick people. He eliminated that. Still, it came back. The only hope that we have is a hope in the plan that God had that he would give his only begotten son to be that sacrifice to take back death, hell, keys, the keys and the grave, the power over the grave, because the devil would no longer have that foothold after Jesus came and sacrificed his life, his blood, for our sins to be forgiven, to break off the power of sin and death forever. That says again, John 10.10, the devil came to kill, steal, and destroy. Jesus came that we would have life with power, authority. Ah, Walking in wholeness. Well, heal, peace, love, joy. We can experience all of the above with the power of the Holy Spirit, his promised gift. So it wasn't until Jesus came that our predisposed tendencies that we don't have to on our and through our own power It was proven throughout the Old Testament that man could not, in his own power, overcome sin. Right? Man could not overcome sin. We fell into it over and over and over again. And to the point that some of it was so, so, oh, yuck. So much yuck. And I believe, I want want to talk some about before we switch over to to Jesus and all the good news that he brought, because we were born onto a battlefield. I believe that, this is according to Lynn once again, I believe that the reason that the devil hates man so much, and we read it, is that man was created in God's image. And man was his favorite creation. And everything else, (laughs) everything else that God created, and he created everything, of everything that he created, man was his favorite because he created man how? In his own image. To some degree, we think like him. We've been given his emotion. We've been given his thoughts. We think like him. We sometimes act like him. It's like, so, oh, man, that just ticks the devil off so bad that there's a creation that was designed and created in his image. He was really pleased with that creation and all that he did. So he has a plan to redeem man back to himself because he is a beloved creation. 
So for God so loved the world, he gave his only son that whosoever believed in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. So what, <laughs> what I have written down here, thought about a, 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 another title, it's like, man, this, it's D-Day. The devil uses tactics, the same back with Adam and Eve and all through, all through history. His tactics haven't changed that much. But one of the things that we have to think about and realize and identify is some of these tactics. And I think, you know, he's a, the devil is a great seductress. He, he seduces people in. When you think of seduce, the first thing that comes to your mind is sexual sin. But seduction is not only sexual sin. If you look up the, uh, in the dictionary, to, to seduce is to pull somebody away from the task at hand to like redirect them to do something different than what they were assigned or what they were supposed to be doing. A seduction, pulling it. Oh. Well, hello, guys. Man, that's been a long time. Well, now we're going to try to figure out where we were. Uh, yeah, seduction. It's like... But <laughs> uh, tempt, but the D's. The devil is out to deceive, divert, distract, dilute, and discourage. I maybe even do them in a different order. Deceive, disrupt, divert distract, dilute, and discourage. It's like, if he can't get you, if he cannot seduce you into something, an, a temptation that he puts in front of you, it's like, okay, well, we'll create some kind of a disruption. We will divert them from the task at hand. We will distract them by something really shiny over here. We will deceive, as he did in the garden, or we will dilute, dilution, not delusion. Dilution is something that I believe that we really struggle with and need to fight in today's society. As things become so diluted, you know, you, you, you put, like, iodine is something that I think is horrible to put in your mouth. But if you mix it in a glass of water and iodine, it, it's not a big deal. You can hardly even taste it. You don't even recognize that it's iodine if you drink enough water with it. So what the enemy begins to do is begin to dilute things. And I, and I feel like this is something that's really significant. And as I talk about a teachable, a teachable moment, Easter, a teachable moment, I think it's a great, I am not anti-Easter by any means. I love Resurrection Sunday, and for most of our life, we've done Easter egg hunts, and we've just had all kinds of fun with Easter. But the older I get, and I just want to let you know, this is going to be my last sermon of my 71st year. Tomorrow I turn 72. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, happy birthday to me. Happy birthday. Uh, the more intentional that I become, but you know, life is sh shorter now. I have less days to live. And in the days that I'm living, but I believe in the days that we are living, and that it's time that we become more and more intentional with what we do, what we celebrate, what we spend our money on, what we spend our energy, where we spend our time. It's like becoming intentional in our beliefs. It's time that we really know what we believe and understand what we believe and be bold enough to share what we believe. It's like, okay, when I think of, you know, we... Did you send that, that picture that we might end up... Oh, no, never mind, too late. Oh, that woman he gave me. 
She's amazing. She's beautiful. She's smart. She's talented. And I would say I'm lucky, but no, I am blessed beyond measure. Blessed beyond measure. So, uh, yeah, I thank you for that one clap. <laughs> uh, thank you. So, so I think Easter is, is a great... You know, what I've decided to end up titling this message is Resurrect Jesus and Bury the Bunny. You see, when we talk about distraction... What do you mean, oh no? <laughs> you don't think Easter bunnies and eggs are, are really cool? You know, I remember when my kids were young, couldn't wait to get out of church to get done with this Easter thing so they could go hunt eggs and get all of that candy and all of the things that came afterwards. So it's like, wow, there was a distraction away from Jesus. We just need to get that over with so we can go hunt Easter eggs so we can go find eggs so we can get all that chocolate so we can get all that candy and that's what Easter is about to so many people we do the thing we will go to church for a little while and do the Easter thing the church thing because it's kind of something that we should do on Easter and then we're going to go we're going to have a, this barbecue and we're going to hunt for eggs it's like <laughs> is that scriptural. It's like, wow. It's like, if Jesus is not lifted up on high, if we're not celebrating the resurrected Jesus, and our focus is on him, we have got our focus in the wrong place. It's like... <sighs> we need to be intentional. I, I think of, you know, it's like... Somebody pointed out to me several years ago, and, and this is something that stuck with me, and he says, well, how do you, I was talking to a guy who was not exactly a Christian yet, and he said, how do you expect people, young people especially, to really believe when they've been taught there's an Easter bunny, they've been taught there's Santa Claus, they've been taught there's a tooth fairy, a leprechaun, it's like, why should they believe that Jesus is real? It's like, Wow. Uh, good point. Good point. Why should they believe that the, the rainbow was a promise and a covenant of God that he would never again flood the earth to do away with mankind? The enemy has come, taken that rainbow, which was a promise of of God and turned it into something completely different that a younger generation wouldn't even realize or understand or know what the rainbow means other than depravity. It's like, oh, 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 this, this, this is wrong. This is not scriptural. This is not biblical. This is like something that is thrown right back in the face of God. He gave us a rainbow for a promise. They've turned that rainbow into something that's absolutely depraved. And said, see this, God? Are you with me? Yes. Are we having fun yet? Yes. <laughs> no. So when I, I think I say we bury the bunny as we resurrect, lift the name of Jesus on high. Notice that as we celebrate Easter, that the colors 
of the bunnies are the colors of the rainbow. It's like, ow, yuck. This is just kind of nasty, isn't it? Okay. <laughs> Hold one for me. Uh, skinny jeans. Uh, oh, that woman he gave me. Okay, we're going to turn now. It's time for some good news. We're going to turn to uh, John. Ten ten. We already read John ten ten. So we're going to turn to First Peter, chapter five, verse eight. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. I just wanted to go one more time back to that, then we're, then we're moving on to John, because it says the devil came, comes only to kill, steal, and destroy. Anything that he can do that will tempt, seduce, divert, distract, deceive, disrupt, or discourage or completely dilute where there is not an impact anymore. The Easter impact needs to be something that's so valuable and important. Like last week, when Pastor Rutson did, you know, the Last Supper, was that not just powerful and incredible? Okay, now we're going to John 10, 10. Actually, 10.10 a little bit later on. But in the beginning, John 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. We're talking about Jesus. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. Through who? And without him... Was made, nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Oh, when we have Jesus in our heart, we have the light in our lives. The light that shines bright, the light that attracts men to us. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness, to bear witness of the light. So he came to just tell us about Jesus, to prepare the way of the living Lord, that all through him might believe. He was not the light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. So light is available for every man coming into the world. Who is Jesus available to and for? Us, every one of us. He was in the world and the world was made through him and the world did not know him. He came to his own, his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to him he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Well, that's powerful, isn't it? He has given us the ability and the right. Everybody say, yeah, that's my right to become children of God. By believing in his name. Okay, I want to turn now to um, John 3. We're going to go verses 1 through 21.
There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night. Uh, he didn't want the rest of the Jews to see him, and he said to him, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher come from God. No one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water, and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. I'm going to tell you that baptism that we did here a little while ago. It's like, that was powerful. It was amazing. We prayed over those two. They both ended up, it's like, you know, a lot of people are, are visitors here. But when the power of God actually hits in a really powerful and a strong way, people just fall down. Those guys both fell down, and we had to drag Alejandro up <laughs> because there was about 15 minutes he just was laying on the ground, just shaking under the power of God, being totally transformed and empowered, <laughs> born of water and of the Spirit. Everybody say, of the Spirit. Of the Spirit. Born of the Spirit. Unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. It's like, well, guys, welcome to the kingdom. <laughs> that which is born of the flesh is flesh. And what did God say about the flesh? Man is flesh. And they're not very happy about it. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Don't marvel that I said this to you. You, that you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes. You hear the sound of it, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said to him, How can these things be? That whole, man, we have got to be able to figure it out in our minds. It needs to make sense to us. Things that are supernatural just don't make sense because they're supernatural. There's nothing natural about them. Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel and you don't know these things? Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know and we testify what we have seen and you do not receive our witness. I've told you earthly things and you do not believe. How will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is the Son of Man who is in heaven. It's like, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. We're talking about Jesus. The way, the truth, the life, the light of the world, Jesus Christ. Our hope, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. I want to turn to 1 John. It's going to be another reference to 1 John. I'm going to have to find it. Bear with me. And the pressure's on. That's when we get nervous, start to sweat. Doesn't take this long. If you knew your Bible, oh, here it is. <laughs> See, First John three eight, we can. We're going to start with verse 7 and probably read through verse 9. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices, practices 
righteousness is righteous, just as Jesus is righteous. So who here practices righteousness? So if you don't practice righteousness, you probably practice sin. So maybe I should ask this again. <laughs> Otherwise, we should get this altar call started right now. <laughs> he who practices righteousness is righteous. How many practice righteousness here this morning? He who sins or practices sin is of the devil. It's like, choose this day whom you will serve. Are we going to practice righteousness led by the Spirit of God because we're children of God, or are we going to practice sin because we're of the devil? It's like we get to choose. And when we choose Jesus... When we're filled with Holy Spirit, we are empowered from on high to do exactly what he's called us to do, fulfill our mission without being distracted, distorted, all of the th things that the devil will do. And he who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the very beginning. For this purpose, the Son of Man was manifested. We're talking about Jesus came that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whoever's been born of God doesn't sin. Like, can we live without sinning? If we are practicing righteousness, God sees our heart, knows our heart, and if we slip and trip, we have just slipped, tripped, and fell. We've skinned our knees, our elbows, our sprained our wrists, whatever. But we get up and take off again because we're practicing righteousness. We've been made perfect in his sight, through his blood, through his sacrifice, and he sees us as perfected. We just have to continue to walk it out and practice righteous living under the power of the Holy Spirit as he leads, guides, and directs. Okay. I think that's... I just want to turn to, we did... Baptism. Let's see if this is something we want to. That time thing. I want to read just a couple verses here. Oh, to the this is in Third John to the beloved guy. <laughs> whom I love in truth. Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. I rejoice greatly when brethren came and testified of the truth that is in you, just as you walk in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. We know that Jesus came, that he died, and we know that Jesus, the, his, the last night, as Pastor Rutzen, as we just did the Last Supper thing, that when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he cried out to his Father because he had been tempted in every way, shape, and form. He had been... The devil tried everything. The devil tried everything with Jesus, and he never failed. He led the perfect life, the sinless lamb, brought to the sacrifice 
of his own volition, of his own will. But that last night in the garden, the last night, he's in the garden and he's asked a couple of his closest to go with him and spend an hour with him and pray. And as Jesus was praying, he called upon the Father and he said, if, if there's any way, if there's any way, he knew the suffering that he was going to go through. He knew the price that he was going to pay, the beating that he was going to take, the death that he was going to have to die. That sacrifice weighed so heavy on him as he realized and as the reality just came on him that he ended up in his prayer time when he was calling on the name of the Father, he actually was sweating drops of blood. And he said, Father, Father, if there's any way that you could take this cup from me, if there's any other plan that would work out, but nonetheless, not my will, but your will be done. You see, the first Adam dropped the ball. He sided with, re with reason. He listened to the voice of the enemy. And you know that Jesus had to be hearing the voice of the enemy when he went before the Father, saying, you don't have to do this. You, don't, you know how bad this is going to hurt. You know what this is going to entail. There could be another way. But Jesus didn't succumb to the other voice. Not for a second. He went through even unto death. A death, a beating, oh, where he was not even recognizable. A crown of thorns stuck on his head, blood running down his face, not even recognizable. Then, oh man, the nails through his hands, the nails through his feet. There on a cross, he died for your sins and for my sins, so that we, so that we could end up walking in the freedom that we would not be under the curse of sin and death. We could walk in freedom, total freedom, unashamed, unabashed, knowing that we are loved, that we are chosen sons and daughters of the Most High. If we could get the prayer team to come up here. If you have never, this is a great opportunity before we end up going and having our, our hamburgers and, and, and celebrating this awesome, awesome day of what the Lord has done. If you have never asked Jesus to be Lord and Savior of your life, if you've never been filled with the Holy Spirit to be endued with power from on high to do and accomplish what he has for you in your life, he's got a plan for your life, then I would just encourage you. Let's all stand together and we're going to pray here just in a second. If you've never asked Jesus to be Lord and Savior of your life, if you do not walk in that freedom that I'm talking about, if you have not experienced that kind of freedom, if you've not experienced joy, if you struggle with shame, if you struggle with any kind of addiction, today is your day. Jesus says, today is the day of salvation. And if you've never asked him, if you've never received him, I say, come on down. You know, it, it's, it's more than just... Sometimes, oftentimes, we see, it's like, well, just raise your hand. If you've never received Jesus, raise your hand. I'm just saying, in reality, what he's asking is that we come, that we confess our sins, that we repent of our sins, and then we walk away completely changed. I've been in a lot of church services where they say, everybody bow your head, close your eyes. If you've never received Jesus, raise your hand. We're going to pray a short prayer. But to end up having the breakthrough that he has for you, it's not about raising your hand and closing your eyes in a short prayer. It's about coming, confessing your sins before the Lord, asking forgiveness of those sins, then repenting of those sins, and those sins will be put into remission. Like cancer in remission, it is no more. It's not effective anymore. So I just encourage you, if, if, if you have never asked Jesus into your heart, come this morning. It's a perfect opportunity. If you need healing of any kind, he's our healer. We believe in supernatural healing. So I'd encourage you, come. If there's an addiction in your life, 
If you just want a refreshing renewal in the Spirit, come. Come on. Everybody's good? Well. I'm not trying to put any pressure on anybody. I just believe that this is a great opportunity, a fabulous opportunity to come, to be filled, to be refreshed, to be renewed, to be set free from the bondage of sin. Father, I thank you that you are such a loving, loving Father, that you so love this world, this creation of yours, that you sent your only son to die a gruesome death on Calvary. I pray that you would bless each one that has come together today to celebrate your love, to celebrate your goodness, and to celebrate the resurrected Jesus. We thank you for that Jesus. We thank you for every promise in your book. And I bless each one gathered here today in Jesus' mighty name. Together we said, Amen. God bless you. Join us.